By the way, part of what we're doing with the members is it's a great time to buy. Mm -hmm. So if you have ever thought about M&A, if you've ever thought of non-organic growth, let's do it now because uh, you have motivated sellers, right? Because they're they're like, okay, I don't want to go through. I don't want to wait seven more years. And so um, some of that's happening in the market. And and it also allows the member to say, well, I only grew 5%, but I added a fourth store. So now I'm like ready for 25 and 26. Welcome to Peer Talk, a dialogue with business owners just like you. Peer Talk conversations run the gamut of business challenges facing owners today. The host of Peer Talk is Dan Crowley, founder and owner of Peer Executive Groups, which provides a safe space for owners to share their experience, grow their businesses, and learn from their peers. Hi, this is Dan Crowley. We have a number of great owners in our peer group network, just like you, and our job is to give you a voice here on Peer Talk. Today's Peer Talk episode is a joint episode with Rental Roundtable by Quipley. Today, Dan Crowley meets with Kyle Clements from Quipley to discuss the founding of Peer Executive Groups and how Peer Executive Groups has helped many businesses succeed in an ever-changing market. All right. Well, everyone, welcome to the 16th Rental Roundtable. Dan, good to see you. I got to see you in person in New Orleans two days ago, but good to see you here in the Zoom world. Good to see you. How was the uh, ARA show for you guys? It was great. We uh, actually had a lot of success Um a ton to follow up on the next week. So we're pretty excited about it. But, uh, you know, it was, I think, our third year where we had the booth near the ARA uh, central booth. So a lot of foot traffic there. Yeah, uh, very jealous of the spot and <laughs> been hearing great things about the peer executive group. For everyone else, I've known Dan for three and a half years, even before we had even a working Quipley product. Um, we we're sort of thinking about, you know, is this a market we want to enter? So I've known Dan and seen the power of the peer groups. We're going to talk about that towards the end of the episode around sort of um, the peer executive model and some of the the, the value of that. But um, really excited about this episode today. Um, Dan, just for everyone else here, maybe talk about your experience, how you've gotten into the rental business and particularly, your, you know, your journey towards starting peer executive groups. Absolutely. Yeah. Rental. So um, I was a uh, serial entrepreneur, uh, very active, both coaching and consulting to small business owners in different industries. And uh, one of those industries was automotive and really uh, got an upfront view into what is considered business analysis or business advisory groups, 2020 groups, peer groups. So whatever you might call them. And uh, one of my clients at the time was Action Rental in Allentown, PA. I was coaching them on E-Myth, which is how to work on your business versus in it. Sounds familiar. It sounds like every uh, you know consultative type of program that's out today. Um, and um, he was saying, "Hey, I love that peer group idea. You know, can we do something like that in the rental industry?" So we launched our first one. Uh, one month after the Twin Towers went down, unfortunately, as anybody who was alive at the time remembers, there was not a lot of travel. And the whole basis of our peer group community is in-person meetings. So it was quite a challenge to launch in that uh, at that time. But we did end up uh, launching a group. They named themselves the Premier Group. And I'm going to be meeting with them for their you know, 23rd year uh, in San, in uh, Southern California in April. So they're still together. Um, and that's really how it all started. We just went from there. We had one group, had a second group pretty quick, and then uh, started to do event rental. So evolved over time. Yeah. And, I, and I, I'm very excited for this episode because, you know, I talk to rental companies every day and, you know, we talked at a one-on-one basis, but you have, you know, several hundred members and you and your facilitator are hearing on the ground, intimate knowledge of what's happening in the rental industry. It's you're, you're sort of been in the room that a lot of even me as a software provider are not always in. So I, I, I'm interested to hear about sort of, um, you know, what you're hearing. I think one thing in particular that I've really enjoyed from the peer executive groups is the focus on the EOS entrepreneurial operating system. We had John on from rental max in December and he talked about that. I think I, what I really like is some of the structure and coaching you're able to provide. And that seems like one of the things that um, you guys have been sort of pushing more sort of that EOS framework for how to operate a business. Absolutely. I mean, you know, just a quick step back on on the whole point of a peer group, right? Like our tagline is uh, shared experience brings individual success. 
And that's really what it's about. It's about um, a business owner needs to know they're not alone and that other people are going through the same feelings they're having, right? So we're very big into experience share. And last time I felt like this was blank um, and, you know, providing uh, each other with support. Um, you know, it's it's ironic that, you know, one of the most uplifting things I feel like you can be part of is based on what keeps you up at night, right? So on the flip, it's kind of, it's kind of like, all right, why why is life so hard for you as a business owner? Um, let's talk about that. So that's really the gist of of a peer group. And um, again, the big thing with an owner, they want to work on their business because it, they realize it's providing them with financial freedom and personal freedom. So uh, that's really what it's about. We we would love to see our members uh, grow from being a slave to the counter to to moving on from there. Uh, one of uh, my favorite quotes comes from an owner, Jim Duke, out of Durango, Colorado, Target Rental. He uh, he says, "I want to learn how to work twenty four seven, which is uh, seven months out of the year, twenty four hours a week." So uh, that was one of his short-term goals, and he was able to achieve it a few years back. Yeah, I really like the community aspect. I mean, you're a business owner. I'm, I'm running a business, and it's often it can be it can be lonely, especially because you sort of don't have a lot of peers. If you're in a local market, the peers you have may be competitors. And I think what you guys do, and I also used to work in the automotive space, so I saw the dealer twenty model. Mm -hmm. Is you sort of connect people across the country who aren't as competitive, and you can. You can kind of share some of those things you're going through on a personal level. It's almost therapy in a sense. There's the business aspect, but a lot of it is just emotionally. How do you navigate this um, challenging thing of running a business? And Absolutely. Uh, that, that's that's been my experience. And the other thing I, I've seen is the people who invest the time into peer groups, in my experience, usually are the cream of the crop. And because they are taking the time to step back, think strategically, work on the business, not execute all the time, day to day. And the people yeah. who invest in in the peer groups and taking the time to work on the business generally seem to have outperform other companies as well. That's just my you know uh, view of the world. No, that's very astute. Yes, exactly. It's you know they it's a person who's willing to be vulnerable with their peers that's going to grow and learn. Right. So there's nothing more compelling to me than a, a person who's growing twenty to thirty percent per year. He's you know, they're doing 15 million in rental and essentially they, they feel guilty if they miss a phone call with their group, right? Mm -hmm. It's a good sign. It means that, you know, they're very committed to it. Uh, there's transparency and vulnerability with everybody. And the accountability piece too, you know, it's one thing you can write your goals on, you're going to talk about it. People are going to check in every three months. Um, you're on the record and there's all these case studies around once you write a goal down, you make it public, you're whatever X 10 times more likely to achieve it. Even just that piece, publicly being on the record in front of your peers that you're going to do X and you have people following up to making sure you're you're, you're following through on what you said you're going to do as well. Absolutely. That's a good point. Um, when we talked a month ago prepping for this episode, I, I'm always interested to hear what are you hearing in the, from your peer groups? And one of the things that uh, one of the first topics you mentioned was just concern about the economy. And at, we were in New Orleans this week at the ARA show. Uh, I was at a jazz bar and ran into one location guy in New Jersey started talking a little bit. He said last year he spent $500,000 on the floor, just on the spot at the, at the A ratio. And this year he spent $0 and he's just concerned around the economy and how do you manage cash flow? And, 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 um, that seems to be a theme of what maybe you're hearing as well. So I'm curious how, what you're hearing on, on uh, from the peer groups and how you guys are sort of navigating this sort of, uh, maybe uncertain economy we're in right now. Yeah. So there's more, um, concern and focus than in the previous six or seven years around what to do next, right? So if you think about people would plan 10% growth, they would then increase their fleet 10%. Uh, they would look to refresh their fleet a certain percent. And, you know, you, to some extent, you can almost build a system around, you know, what you're going to go buy and how, you know, it, it's not just gut, right? Like you can actually create a plan around it. Here's the problem with that theory today. The the price, the supply chain and uh, different uh, economic issues have created a, uh, a significant increase in new equipment, mm -hmm. um, which makes your life different as a rental owner than it was in the past. 
all of a sudden you may be selling used equipment and then having to go out and refresh your fleet and buy new. And guess what? Your ROA, your return on asset, your return on investment is not going to be the same as it was. Um, so that creates a challenge for just a pure growth model. The second part to that is the economy and the market and what's happening there. So when you look at residential construction versus commercial construction, they're very different things. So, you know, I really need to know if an owner is looking to exit in the next five, six, seven years, it could be a problem for them to shift gears and focus on longer term contracts, bigger contracts, bigger iron, different type of inventory, which as if anyone's aware, like obviously the investment in infrastructure continues and there's just continued growth on the commercial construction side. So that's where, um, you know, people have to make choices. Now, I will say that in specific regional markets, you absolutely see a really nice forecast for residential construction, which, you know, hourly rental and weekend warriors, it'll continue. So the key is to find out if you are exact in that market that shows that type of growth. And if you are, then you got a good chance. But, but I would also say uh, our focus in the last year has been about taking market share from our competitors. Um, and I will say that that is not easy to do. Uh, what sets you apart from your peers, right, in your market? So we're seeing a very big um, focus right now on sales and marketing, which involves um, outside sales. You know, seeing your rental company as not a fulfillment or order taking company, but seeing your rental company as a sales organization. What does that look like? Have you identified the three unique things about you that make you different? Um, how are you uh, segmenting your audience, your market segment, your customer segment? You know, that's a big one. So for event rental, we look at, you know, how much of your business comes from consumers versus institutions or corporate, because all three of them have a different forecast in the next. 12 months, right? So you have to think about what could happen in terms of slowdown. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you mentioned some of the things that um, on on taking market share, how challenging that is. Um, and you have to focus on the things that make you different. What, what are you seeing as themes? If, you know, if I'm a one, two location equipment rental company and I'm sitting here listening to this episode, what are the things, what are the themes that help make rental companies different? You mentioned outbound sales. I'm curious some of the other things you're thinking about uh, some advice you'd maybe give some of the one, two location equipment around. Companies. Well, you know, the first recommendation I would make is that everyone take the time to really understand the values of your company. And the way to do that is to look at your best employees and say, why is it, why do I like them so much? Why, why is that person, you know, exemplify what I'm expecting? So you get those characteristics down and that becomes kind of your values. It's very important you do that because not only will it help you align other employees and recruiting new employees to your values, um, obviously it it points out the bad apples pretty quickly. It helps you to address whether they become, you know, continue to be part of the landscape or not. But the bigger thing is I need to start to message the marketplace. I need people to understand what we're about and what we're trying to accomplish. So it really begins with the values, um, but it it will at some point be uh, related to your vision. So you're going to say, you know, because everybody's in a different phase. You're either in an entrepreneur or you're in a growth mode or you're in a mature phase or you're in a transition phase, right, where you're going to be handing off to next generation or something like that. So they all bring different things to the table. Also, just like you know, all of us who are invested in the stock market, you're income focused or you're growth focused. So are you reinvesting in the company um, to to move down that path? Um, but I would but I would say that how you communicate your what your vision is, what your values are to the marketplace is really identifying who you are versus a person down another rental operation down the street. Mm -hmm. Well, and I like you, you sort of start at the foundation, the values, the vision. You know, we we hear it a lot. Hey, should I buy this piece of equipment or that? And it's well, out of context, it's hard to say because you have to understand what are you where are you at the business and also what is your vision. You know, we had Jeff uh, Lignagaris on from Northside Tool Rental 
in October. And he I remember his, he talked about his different values. One of them was have an attitude and, and it was very specific to his business. And, um, you know, for us at Quipley, we had seven values and we actually had our employees vote on them and we cut it down to five and we ranked them based on, and, but, but it, it, it was an organic thing. And some of the values I thought were good for the business, no one resonated with. Right. So, you know, I, I really like what you said around looking at the employees and having it bottoms up rather than top down in a sense, but that needs to be yeah. vision of where you want to go as well. We, we do employee surveys for rental operations, third party, confidential, all that good stuff. And one of the things that happened uh, for a Sacramento entity that we were working with was um, their employees kept saying, um, you know, why, uh, we asked them, why do you like working here or whatever it is? And they say, it's fun. It's a fun environment. Well, the owner and the leadership team had no clue, mm. not at all. And I'm like, okay, you just got surveys back from your entire staff saying they work here because it's fun, but yet you're not using it as a value in your company. So that was one of the uh, values that was added uh, to their list of values. Yeah. And I think it's important to understand what you want as a, as a person, as a whole person, not just the work person. You know, I had a, I think you met Tim, who's our investor. He was at the show. He told me he only invests in companies if it's fun. If it stops being fun, he doesn't want to participate anymore. And I think that that's sort of how he lives his life. And I think it's important to understand what you want as a as a as an individual that because you know if you're running a business, even if you're not working 24 seven, I find I'm thinking about 24 seven. Even if I'm not right. doing 24 hours a week, I, at least we're at our phase, you're kind of honestly thinking about it, and it needs to be. I, I don't know. I just find I find that the separation of work life balance is is hard sometimes as a owner, and and if that's going to be intertwined to your life, it needs to fit into who you want to be outside of work as well. Absolutely. Yep, you're correct. So on the on the economic side, I'm I'm interested in some of the key indicators that you're looking at um, sure. that help I'll help you understand sort of where the market's going. And I know this is sort of a strong point for you as a as a finance person, but what are the, some of the numbers you're looking at as you think about where the rental market is going? So I was uh, really excited yesterday to run across John McClellan from uh, American Rental Association, as well as you know some of the other brains that are working in that space. Um, uh, Jeff Rogan is is working with education and all that. So, it, you know, it's neat to see the different things people look at. We had one operator who was obsessed with small manufacturing. So there's an indicator out there on small uh, manufacturing and, you know, what their metric looks like. He took that and over a course of five years had the data plugged against rental and saw that it was correlated one to one over a 12 month period. So you could literally say, if this goes up, we know 12 months from now, ours is gonna go up. So it was really neat to discover that type of indices out in the market and say, whoa, that's a driver to tell equipment rental operations uh, what's on the horizon. So for us, uh, we look at, uh, we are subscribers to ITR, which we recommend. Um, we've had a good uh, feeling, uh, they have, I think a 94.7% success, uh, rate hmm. on forecast, which it, that's what it's all about. Right. So you always say like, okay, they're forecasting this, what's their track record. Mm -hmm. And they seem to be pretty successful, but I will say that, uh, they offer a monthly leading indicator, uh, which is, uh, an amalgamation of a couple different le leading indicators that help people, um, you know, have a sense of what is on the horizon, one year, th uh, three year outlook. Um, and so what we're doing is we're looking at um, construction starts. We're looking at architectural billing index. Uh, in fact, if you Google architectural billing index, you'll get to a website where the first thing you see is a number that's in a box. And that box is either red or I forget the other color, blue, maybe. <laughs> But if it's red, you know that that's bad. What that means is that architectural buildings are below the halfway point of where they typically are. And that means there's a slowdown ahead, right? So that's on the front end. Uh, if you think about the um, economy and lead indicators, it's a train. So you want to find out what the head cars are on the train. Rental typically is on the back of the train. So mm. it's, you know, except for event rental. But um, with equipment rental, you're you're in the back, so you you can see everything coming a mile away, um, and that's good news for us. The problem with it is we are forecasting a uh, kind of a flat 2024, if not a negative 
2024 based on the fact that we're just in the back of the train and now is our time, right? Um, I will say that it will not happen to heavy construction equipment. Um, they will have a banner year again. Infrastructure spend is still going to go. So just make sure you have inventory because if you have bigger contracts or longer term contracts, you're going to continue to have success. Um, when it comes to event rental, you know, uh, so residential is on the rebound. Residential hit rock bottom back in the summer. Um, so just real quickly on the homeowner market, uh, we saw a number of homeowner focused rental operators start to buy again in the early fall. And uh, so they continued their buying habits. Um, we do, you know, forecast flat for the next 12 months. But the cool thing is it looks like 25 and 26 are going to be pretty good for construction. So that's where I think, you know, we'll be back where we were. I mean, hey, let's be honest. We're spoiled in the uh, tool and equipment rental space. We have probably more success than oh, so many other industries, right? On the event side, you need to worry about uh, res um, consumers. You need to worry about corporate and you need to worry about institutions. And again, event versus tent. So really identify your lead indicators for those and then make your forecast based on it. But I do like our members. I ask every member, what's your number this year? I need them to think about where they're going to be 12 months from now because when when you don't do that, you have a tendency to sit still and have your expenses continue to clobber you without the growth to support the expenses. Mm. I think your position is particularly interesting because you have the ITR forecast and all the economic data, but you also have the boots on the ground data. And if you're asking yes. your members, give me your forecast 12 months and you can sort of look across the entire nation, across hundreds of companies, you have a different data point that a lot of people don't see. Correct. Is there ever a split between what the- uh, Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So we we had uh, two years ago, I want to say it was 22, um, we knew that our network was flying. We knew they were flying. And I can't remember if it was, I know that we were at least five points uh, better than the average equipment rental and event rental operator. Now, again, it, some could say, well, well, Dan, you charge for peer groups, so you're getting all the guys who can afford it, right? Uh, it could be some of that. But at the end of the day, growth is growth. So whether you're $1 million or $10 million, and typically, you know, it's it, sometimes it's harder to grow 10% when you're $10 million than mm -hmm. when you're $1 million. But but I will say that um, we definitely were outpacing. Um, and it was, I forget the number. We actually, we put it on our social media. We were all excited about it. Uh, I should probably make sure we do it every year going forward. Yeah. But um, but I will say that uh, it doesn't come easy. It's not like you're open for business and you're like, oh, we had a great year. You know, no, one thing I can tell you that I've learned over the years, your profitability is totally dictated by your retention of employees. So that's number one. So especially on the event side, when you consider 50% of all costs are employees. So when you're training and developing new employees all the time, it, it's going to kill you, right? So that's why it's so important to have the right people on the bus, right? Um, and then when it comes to um, equipment rental, um, you know, you definitely want to stick to your knitting and stay focused on what you bring to the table. But um, don't be afraid. Everybody's moving towards, uh, and frankly, Quipley is a leader in the space, right? So where Quipley is headed is where all of our members are going, uh, which is to basically understand the market, uh, you know, understanding what's what's going on in a specific market, but um, also um, being able to campaign and create the marketing campaigns you need to generate interest, right? Um, anything you could do with CRM type approach to the world uh, is useful. All the pipes, uh, all the funnels that you can measure the success of your prospects moving down through, that is a foreign concept to most rental operations. So they need to be thinking of themselves as a sales organization. Yeah. And I think, as you know, and what I, you know, Josh Nichols, a guest here, he sort of said that, uh, you know, the uh, Deloitte ranked the equipment rental industry 47 out of 48 in terms of technology adoption, right? That's sort of why we entered the market is, is, 
that's the case. And I was thinking about how quickly technology is changing. And I don't know if that has to be the case because like, you know, we started with online renting and that was still new Mm -hmm. and it's been in every other industry for 10, 15 years. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about where does this go next? I think it's AI, which is one of the next topics I want to talk about. Do we need to be 15 years behind on that as well? I don't actually think we need to. I think we can change that in the rental industry. And, and, and just me, this is year four for me here, still new to the space. It seems like people are eager to adopt new technology. And mm-hmm. this kind of gets to this next point, because I asked you, what are you hearing about in your peer groups? The first thing you said was the economy. The second thing you said was AI. So I want to hear from your perspective, what are you hearing around how people are starting to think about AI and particularly how they can incorporate that into their business? So there's a lot of great resources on the internet about AI as it relates to business development. I think the key for you is to take a piece of paper and write down, you know, in your particular business, you know, a few words about your strategy and understanding what strategy means to you. Um, And really strategy lots of times has to do with vision. They're kind of hand in hand and looking into the future um, what will your business look like in three years? Um, you know, almost envision it, right? And so then you start to see how AI fits into that landscape. Um, absolutely, when it comes to communication um, and marketing, AI is going to be a massive piece, right? Uh, you can see it already. You can see, you know, people don't need publicists anymore. People don't need, you know, there's certain roles that are going away. Um, because AI can iterate, 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 and and give you uh, tremendous value. Um, you know, I we had one idea. So we do these things called idea contests in the peer groups. And uh, the ideas that have been winning these contests uh, every meeting have been AI solutions. One that I recall was um, they had tied behavioral analysis to their uh, point of contact of their customer to communicate better. So it was kind of like, okay, we have a, and and again, this is getting in the weeds, but let's just say um, this is a dominant personality and they like things quick and short and you just have to communicate very quick with them. Um, And then there's another one that's like more influential communicator and just likes to know what's going on in the market, how are things going? They need to be, you need to be a little more wordy with them on the phone when you're trying to get them to pay their bill, right? That kind of thing. So just um, sending a letter over an email, but having AI write it for you in the context of uh, the person's behavioral profile. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a brilliant idea. It eliminates um, a lot of harsh feelings back and forth because you're, you're speaking to who they are behaviorally. Um, so that's an, ex- that's an extreme version of AI where you're kind of, you're saying, okay, I want you guys to use behavioral analysis and communicate with my customers. Right. Um, and then the other part I would say, which I love and everybody loves is process improvement, right? So I'm going to document this process. I'm going to verbalize it. It's going to write it up. I'm going to have it, um, improved. Um, just asking the questions and then what, and what next? Well, what about this? And when you read something, AI might kick back to you, you're going to be able to say, well, it doesn't really feel right. I feel like you're missing it by this amount. You know, AI is going to reply back and it's going to, it's going to fix it. So some of the stuff I read when I go visit the rental operations, looking at their standard operating procedures, a lot of people are now doing um, videos instead of documentation on on operating procedures. So it, it is going to be a huge change uh, over the years. You're going to be able to cut some costs, no question. Yeah, I guess I, you know, I'm I sort of in the technology world, so I I see these trends. I have always been skeptical of crypto, NFT. Just didn't get it. AI, I'm 100 on board. I really believe that is the future of rental software, but. I was, I guess I was surprised when I asked you, what are you hearing in the peer groups? The second thing you said was AI. How often is this coming up in, in conversations with your, you know, the rental groups you work with? You know, I'm the old guy in the room, right? So I'm, I'm the old guy now. And so I'm like, just kind of catching up. I will say we have five leader groups. Those are groups that are not owners. They are leaders. And, and you could almost look at it from a perspective of where are the young guys, what are the young people talking about these days? And even on the event rental side, um, they're incorporating AI into the business on a regular basis. 
they know they're going to come back and get a high five from their peer group every six months if they do something with it. And frankly, it's there's it's a low cost solution, right? So anything that you're able to do with it and put it in place can be helpful. Um, I think when you look at uh, marketing tools and support and and support marketing companies, um, all of that's going to play into it as well. So you, if you can think it in your head for a brief moment, you might as well get it out of your mouth and get it into a chat GPT environment or um, potentially some support people who also have familiarity with AI and how it's used. Yeah, I think some of the analogies I'm thinking about, you know, going back four years when we're starting quickly, there's a lot of hesitation around online renting. You shouldn't put prices online. No one's going to want to do it. But then you start asking questions. Well, do you rent, you, you know, do you go on Amazon? Do you order coffee on your phone? People are like, yeah. And that because they do in, the, in their personal lives, they're actually they're seeing the transition into the business world. And I think what I'm seeing is there's a lot of people in their personal lives, even in their business are now using AI that it, it's become less scary, even in 12 months. It's totally changed. And, you know, just I'm going to break. I have one rule at, on these round round tables. Is we don't talk about quickly, but I want to break it for 30 seconds because I want to show you sort of what came out this week. Um, actually, Evan, you probably need to enable screen sharing here in a second. But, um, you know, we want to start experiment, experimenting with AI. And we found that with one engineer, one day, we lost a feature this week using AI in our software. Uh, I want to That's show awesome. you again. My screen sharing is disabled here. Maybe we'll come back to it. Um, well, I'll, I'll come back to it at the end. Yeah. But it sounds good we, though. Yeah. We get a lot of questions around like, how do I edit an order? How do I extend a, a rental? Things like that. And what we found was we get all these support tickets we, and we respond. And we have a button now, ask quickly, mate, in the corner. You can ask a question in real time and it'll write you a real time response, personalized to your specific question. And so if you think about, um, you're training new employees or shortage of people and your people onboarding to a new system, you know, that's real time. Actually, here I go. I'll show you here. Uh, can you see my screen, Dan? Yes. Yep. So this is the back end system, but you can ask quickly, mate, how do I edit in order? And, you know, this is reading all of our knowledge base articles, all of our support tickets, and it's writing a real time response personalized to you using AI in the system. This was one, one engineer, one day. And at the end, it'll link you into you know, some some support tickets. It'll ask you was a thumbs up, thumbs down. You could sort of um, you know you know it's a thumbs up here. It'll link in some of some of the support tickets here. But this is where the technology. This is one day. You know. Yeah, that's a six month initiative three years ago. Yeah, and I didn't even think. I mean, <laughs> it's totally different, and, and that's why I'm excited because I think that it's coming faster than people can comprehend. Yeah, it's, this is where the technology is. So. I think next year ARA show, there's going to be a lot more AI initiatives. And and I think particularly in software companies, because I think it's interesting what you're seeing and people are updating vision statements and how do you respond to emails and maybe reviewing legal documents. But I think the software companies really need to drive a lot of this because there's just so much opportunity to make the rental business more efficient. It's all around improving workflows. And um, that, that's something just on my soapbox that I'm excited yeah. about. Yeah, no, I, I love it. I mean, we two years ago, we wrote a class called Rental Leaders Bootcamp which is focused on branch level all the way up to COO of rental companies and what's important. And uh, we actually are doing version 2.0 for the upcoming uh, season. And it's got AI all over it for that reason, just like what you showed. If you think about uh, rental operations, some of them tried to differentiate themselves by saying that they're solutions-based. Hey, you know, we have rent, we have stuff you can rent, but at the end of the day, our counter people, uh, man, they are focused. They are going to focus in on your project and make sure that you're taken care of with the solution. Well, guess what? What you just shared and what you just showed, that's it, right? So um, that comes into play with your staff. It comes into play with um, you know what you're going to need in terms of attachments and all sorts of ancillary um, needs from a rental or job fulfillment perspective, right? So I, I just think, I totally agree. And I think it's coming faster than I thought six months ago, for yeah. sure. You know, and I think some of the other use cases, you're taking uh, 360 videos and pictures of your equipment before and after. You can use AI to, to start detecting some of those things very yep. easily. That scratch wasn't there when that went out. Uh, I've always thought dynamic pricing in the industry needed to happen. It happens in hotels and airlines, as you know, as you went to New Orleans. Absolutely. And, you know, you could build all these rules systems and, but like the machine, the machine learning is there now you have access to open AI and it's just very easily to plug into. And 
you know, how do you, you know, I think on the, on the marketing side, as you mentioned, you know, there's, is there a chat bot on the customer website that can help answer questions around, Hey, I need to dig a hole. What do I need? And I just think that it's going to happen way faster than I thought. I may be wrong and this is recorded. So I'll be on the record that I'm wrong, but I just really think that it's happening. I was encouraged to hear how many of your groups are already thinking about it too. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. And, and again, one of the things that's nice about the peer groups is someone always hosts a meeting. They're always in person, although we do do virtual every month as like just a touch base. Sometimes we have good content uh, from an expert like yourself who will join a group of 10 owners. But the in-persons are all about discovery, um, both for the person who's on the tour and also for the person who is got 10 expert rental operators walking through their place and evaluating those types of things. Uh, we try to continue with the technology and make that an improved environment. So when somebody, when we get off the bus and we start walking around, everyone has a form on their phone. Uh, so it's literally, you know, we used to carry around papers and pencils and, you know, and say, hey, keep notes when you walk through. Now it's actually, I, hey, I'm in the front showroom. I'm looking at the form on my phone and adding in some notes and it's all going to central deposit. And, you know, we we come out of the, the um, uh, the tour and everything's already built out. So mm-hmm. they get a completed report from the 10 other rental guys, but at the same time we can use it for learning and discovery and then discussion. Right. So um, it, it is insane what is happening right now with AI as well as other technology improvements. Yeah. I, I think it's not linear. I think people think of technology as linear and it, I don't agree with that I think it accelerates. And I think we're at a period of time that's accelerating. And I don't think, Everyone's comfortable with that. That doesn't mean you need to like it, but I, I think you probably need to accept it because I do think it's happening. Um, you know, we talked about the economy. We talked about AI. The third thing I you mentioned around what you're hearing in the peer groups is sort of living through some of the supply chain problems. And I'm curious yeah. to hear what the last few years have been like for some of your members and, and how is that changing where we kind of go through 2024, 2025, particularly around supply chain? Sure, absolutely. So um, I would say up to about... Two years, two and a half years ago, um, it was pretty, uh, not going to say it was easy, but it was definitely something where, and we all know this, you would place an order and you knew when to expect it. You know, there was always going to be like, oh, that's 10 months away and all that. You always knew, you know, that kind of thing. But the point was, you knew it. You knew that you would order it at the show and that you'd receive delivery in the fall or whatever it might be. Um, that went away about two and a half years ago. So then it became, um, you know, and there are questions like, how do I plan my growth if I don't have the tools and the equipment to rent to fulfill my plan, right? It's an extremely complicated uh, management issue, um, unlike other businesses, right? Because the idea was, well, you order, you order more product, you get it out and you distribute it, right? That's how it works. Rental is not like that, right? So um, it has been uh, very different. And I believe in some part it has spurred or supported exiting the industry. So you're seeing a lot of my peers at my age who have now like gotten to the position where they're like, you know what, there's a lot more work to the rental industry than there used to be. And so uh, the supply chain and what happened uh, two years ago was, was pretty rough. Now, the good news is it seems that those days are behind us again. Uh, who's to say when it happens again? But at the end of the day, um, it just like COVID, it forced our owners to be creative with solutions. You know, people who never bought used equipment as part of their inventory all of a sudden found a way. Um, you know, the, the different auction houses have played a part in that. And then there was some big acquisitions last year. You know, when Ahern was purchased and all that equipment made it back into the marketplace, it changed the dynamic, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so owners have to know what they're going to do with that. I would would say I'm not trying to make a a point for peer groups, but holy cow, could you imagine being a rental owner and not be networked? Like it's, it's, it's it's a tough experience. And the other thing that's encouraging is we are seeing a lot of people entering the rental industry, uh, but, you know, with big wide eyes, right, you're kind of like, uh, they look like deer in headlights when they start to discover 
all the influencers and all the impacts to their business. It's not, it's not a strict linear uh, way to go to market the way a lot of other businesses are. So Yeah. And we see it on our side too. A lot of people entering the market. We also have been seeing people exiting the market too. Um, you see that I'm sure as, are you, do you how, how, when you think about consolidation, how do you think that's accelerating in the market? I know United, some I feel like they keep buying companies every month. Yeah. What are you seeing on the consolidation side? So it's it's still happening. It's um you know it, uh, we hit a high point in the fall of 2021. Uh, the multiples were higher than in, ever. Um, the due diligence done by the big guys was less than ever. I mean, due diligence traditionally from an M and A perspective uh, would take 90 to 180 days, and what we were finding was they'd get to a verbal agreement on price. And money would start transitioning by, you know, 60 to 90 days. Um, and it, I think it was rightfully so done by United and Sunbelt, some of the bigger ones, Herc, Herc and all the, because um, it was the cost of money, right? Like, let's just go, go, go. And that was really their focus. Um, we at peer groups, we do about two to three valuations a week. Mm -hmm. um, so we are constantly being asked by everybody in the industry to please give me a valuation of my company. I want to position it for sale. Um, and so we kind of, we do not act as a broker to uh, buyers, but what we do is we connect you to brokers and we also mm -hmm. make you very much aware of the steps involved. Cause that's the other thing is no one's really telling you what it's like to go through the process. Um, people are looking at it like, well, I'm 70 years old. It's time for retirement. And this is what I'm going to live on. And then they realize that, oh my gosh, valuations are down 25%. And mm. uh, I should have sold two years ago. That, by the way, that typical cycle is about seven years. So if you go backwards, uh, the last 21 to 28 years, um, about every seven years, you're going to see uh, it be at the higher point. So you really need to kind of wait for your cycle to come around if you're an individual why not, right? If you can almost guarantee you're going to have a 25% uh, better uh, response in your portfolio, your personal balance sheet, right? So um, I think that's what we're seeing with consolidators. It's We're on the downslope. Um, we did lose 20 members last year to um, consolidation, which, you know, we go through a pro practice of offboarding a member uh, they become alumni. We stay in touch. That kind of thing happens. Um, but I will say it's different, right? It's it's like, okay, loved working with you for 10 years and then they leave, right? The network. So um, I would say that anyone who is looking at succession transition in the next five years, at the end of these next five years, you'll probably be in a good spot. There'll be some uh, significant multiples out there. Um, and, uh, certainly, you know, don't be afraid to, to reach out to any of us, uh, to find out like what your plan should be when it comes to transition. Um, uh, we've also found that the SBA and other lenders have been really, uh, comfortably participating in, um, having key employees and, um, children of owners being the finance, um, approach, like being, um, in, um, investable, so to speak. So uh, we have good news on that. That was something that was always a challenge in the past. I would say, well, if your value is over 2 million, you're not going to be able to sell to your kids. And that has gone away. So it's probably closer to 5 million now. Hmm. So and kind of the rule of thumb, the seven year cycle, I mean, the future is always uncertain, but 2021 was a high point. You're sort of saying 2028 or so, that'll be another high point. We're right. sort of in a down. So now is maybe not the best time to sell you're saying yeah, like, by the way by the way part of what we're doing with the members is it's a great time to buy mm -hmm. so if you have ever thought about m a if you've ever thought of non-organic growth let's do it now because uh you have motivated sellers right because they're they're like okay i don't want to go through i don't want to wait seven more years and so um some of that's happening in the market and and it also allows the member to say well I only grew 5%, but I added a fourth store. So now I'm like ready for 25 and 26. Hmm. That's a uh, that's the way to view that as an opportunity. I like that. Uh, are you seeing your members buying stores? Is that, um, yeah. is that becoming more common? Yes. Yeah, we're there to help. We actually, this is kind of fun. 
Um, I love it. I was an M&A guy forever. So I like to call the target and say, hi, I'm Dan Crowley from Peer Executive Groups. Um, I just want you to know that one of our members is going to be um, expanding his organization into your marketplace. But before we got too far into that, I thought I should call you to see if you had any interest in selling. So I'll, I like doing those calls just for fun. So I do them and we if anybody uh, responds positively, then we get it into the hands of our, our member. Yeah. And you're sort of the neutral party, right? You're just sure. calling interesting. You could sort of match make in a sense. Um, yeah, that's interesting. One one thought I had I, just from the show, because I, I think about consolidation because ultimately like if, on an extreme version, that means there's less rental companies for quickly to sell software. That's, how, you know, the, how big is our Absolutely. market? Same market. with us. Yeah. And I think we're sort of similar in that. Um, my, one th- question I had was if 20 of your members got acquired every year, are there smaller groups that take their spot or does the middle market just sort of disappear? I don't, I'm curious how you think about that. Is there, I, I, we see I, a lot of small groups growing. I'm wondering, do they end up becoming the next target in 10 years from now? I mean, it's interesting. The, the, um, the rental industry is expanding faster than that being a, a negative impact. Mm-hmm. So I'm not afraid of consolidation. In fact, everything that goes around comes around, right? So at the end of the day, we're getting more individuals into the rental industry than ever before. It's becoming more professionally viewed than ever before. Um, there's there's more money coming in for salaries, benefits, everything. Everything is better than it was, regardless, regardless of what people want to say, especially old guys like me. Um, you know, you, you, it's better than it has ever been. So I am absolutely encouraged. Um, and you know, even these, even these investment banking and, um, you know, uh, what I call, um, family owned businesses that there's so much money out there. And so they are like, oh, this looks like a fun industry. Well, it is a fun industry. Yeah. So, you know, they come in and they want to say, Hey, I'm, I've been in the industry for six months. What do I do? Well, that's my favorite call, right? Because mm-hmm. it's like, hey, we'll put you on the path. It's going to be fun. So um, I think I'm very encouraged. I'm a, a very optimistic person that way. Yeah. I mean, I'm generally an optimist too. What is your view 10 years out? You know, the, the, like a longer view, right? Because there'll be ups and downs. Sounds like you're generally feeling bullish around the just equipment rental market as yeah. a whole in the next decade. So 10 years from now, Quipley will have bought peer executive groups. <laughs> and uh, no. I think other way around, probably. <laughs> No, I, I think, um, you know, again, as I stated, wow. I mean, if you think about the technology, that's to me, and I'm sort of like you, I'm a geek that way. I, I love- You call me a geek? Come on, yeah, I'm not- Yeah, I'm calling you a geek. So anyway, no, I do love um, technology and where it can head. I mean, my goodness, like you could just see it. You, I mean, just the videos and the visual cues related to rental these days- I mean, I, I was, you're too young, but when I was back in the day, it it was like, oh, did you get your pictures up on the internet mm-hmm. for your assets? You know, now it's like going to be, it's going to be so different and it's going to be that way for transaction. It's going to be that way for training and support. I mean, it, it's always been there the last 30 years, but it's just going to be different. Um, and part of it for me, I really appreciated that uh, TV show Jobs of Tomorrow or whatever that mm-hmm. was that was on um, Tubi or mm-hmm. I think it's Amazon Prime carried it, but just showing how rental factors into the future, like sustainability is it's all rental, right? So if you think about it, you have the ability as a rental operator, you have the ability to be on the front end of all that's going to be coming in the future. So it's kind of cool. Yeah, I you know this I, this this is my third ARA show, and I feel more excited than ever leaving this one because it's just the underlying business is strong, although maybe it's dips or whatever. But like taking a longer view, it's a yeah. very strong underlying business. There's a lot of desire for innovation. There's a lot of openness too. Like other industries, if you work in deal, I've worked with car dealerships and automotive, yeah. a little bit more competitive. The rental industry has always been very open, and it yeah. seems to be the and that's actually good for everyone because the pie gets bigger, and it just seems like. I, just the next 10 years of rental, it's going to look very different. It's exciting because, you know, I think both of us help are going to help shape part of that. Yep, absolutely. And I think more money's pouring in than ever. I've seen yeah. that. And that's a big part of it. So I think, you know, it's going to attract more talent. We're going to have smarter people in the industry than ever before. Everything's going to be good. So that's just my, you know, pessimistic view on things. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, on the last topic here is the peer group. We sort of talked about that throughout. Um, I'm, my, my thought question is how early is, um, I guess it, my question is, is it too, when, when is too early to join a, a peer group? When is the right time to start thinking about that? I want to take my business to the next level. I want to join a peer group. That's a great point. So uh, we just added a new member um, two days ago that uh, does not have any rental asset inventory yet. Hmm. So if you think about that, that's a tough sell. I've got to take that business and present it to a group of 10 owners and they have to say, yes, we would like them to be a member of our group. Hmm. So um, I love it. It's a challenge. But what we're doing is we're focusing on the people. So we're not focusing on the businesses. You know, we certainly have a profile on every member. We know what technology they're using. We know what equipment they're renting. Uh, we know all the information. You have that through the management software, through the, you know, Rouse analytics and different things like that. But at the end of the day, uh, the inventory of the human involved with those business businesses, that's what counts for us. So um, I would say it's never too early. Um, and there's always something you could do. I mean, just the, uh, the, I mean, you have a podcast, right? I send them to your podcast. Um, we have 50 podcasts for peer talk and, uh, I think 49 of them are, uh, members, right? So, so it's kind of like, it's from their own mouth. Hey, I hit this crossroads and this is what I had to do to, to cross over that crossroads. So I think, um, as early as possible, same thing with the ARA. I feel like a person that gets into the rental industry, the first thing I do is I plug them into the ARA with the resources. Um, so I think, you know, there's a lot available for this industry. Yeah. And we, we see it a lot of people, you know, they ask us for advice on how to run a rental business. I'm like, well, you know, I'll talk to you about software, but I always, the trio, it's like, join the ARA, talk to James Wade for your rental contract, join the peer executive group because- <laughs> You know that that's sort of what that's you need. My, yeah, that's my line. <laughs> <laughs> and keep it easy, right? Um, have you seen success with groups get, getting started or six months of revenue, twelve months of revenue, join a peer group and sort of go off the races? Have you seen? Oh, your- oh my gosh, yeah, amazing. Um, you know, I have so many success stories. We don't have time to cover them right now, but I will say, like someone who I love uh, when somebody goes, I you know, I bought my parents out or they gifted me ten percent of the company. And then they join a peer group because I know three years, four years, they're moving at a clip that their parents could not move at. Like ultimately, mm-hmm. you know, reality is reality is, is you start thinking about income versus growth. So mm-hmm. you don't want to refresh as fast. You don't want to take the profits and reinvest them. So, but young people, that's, um, you know, that's the way they roll. They, they are like, let's grow, let's grow, let's grow. Uh, they're very excited about it. So, you know, one individual, the business was valued at six million. It's now, you know, or two years ago, we revalued it at sixty million. Wow. It was just blow blew me away, and uh, he's probably closer to a hundred million at this point. But that's crazy for a small, independent, family-owned rental operation, right? It's just great, great stuff. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not really, I don't like like pushing product, but I just generally believe in what you guys are doing because, like, I know what the the, the financial costs, there's a little bit yeah. of, me- there's a bigger time investment, but compared to the return you get, I don't, can't imagine a better use of your time. You're learning, you're growing together. You're just avoiding pitfalls, you know, like, and we have a board that helps guide us because, you know, we're going to make mistakes and that's what the peer group offers. And it's, you're learning and growing together and just not as long. I just, I just love what you guys are doing. I think it's so important. I wish there were more people knew about it and a lot of people do, but I just continue to just recommend it because it's just, just amazing. It's an amazing thing. It's it's yeah. it's sort of the the flock. The herd is stronger together, right? And and I, I just I just love what you guys are doing. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah, we we keep the costs low for that reason. You know, they got travel expense, but outside of that, it's you know seven hundred and fifty dollars a quarter. Like you can't yeah. for the amount of stuff that is available. Now the key is there's tons available. Also, when you're working with Quipley and when you're working with different operators in the industry, so the key becomes. How do I manage that? What can I handle in 90 days? What can I handle in 12 months? What are my goals at the end of 12 months? So I think that's important mm-hmm. that, you know, people establish, like, I'm, I'm excited. I came home from New Orleans. I got a blank piece of paper here. I'm going to write down, like, the key takeaways and how that will factor into the next 90 days. Mm. 
I love it. Um, two final questions. Tactically, what's the best way for people to get in contact with you if they're interested in the peer group? How should they reach out to you? Yeah, so our I would say our website's number one. It's peerexecutivegroups.com. Um, and also don't be afraid to look up our podcasts. Uh, it's uh, Peer Talk with Dan Crowley. Um, and it's all over Apple, um, Spotify, any place you'd find podcasts. Um, but, you know, again, plenty of, of content up there. Um, and yeah, so the website's probably the best. There's interest forms. So there's online interest, there's online signups, there's online. So you, you technically can say I'm joining a peer group and we might not know about you until after you've joined. And then we, and then we plug in at that point, but, but yeah, it gets you, uh, the activity really quickly. Um, there's a couple of things we like to do in onboarding and orientation. So it's really 90 days of consulting, which is free. There's not really a cost associated. Well, I should say. It's $399 for onboarding, and that gets you all the consulting in, of course, the swag box. You got to get your your peer group swag. So that's part of the fun. I got to get some peer group swag. Um, yeah. And and of course, anyone who knows me, you can reach out to me, Kyle, quickly, and I'm happy to make a personal introduction mm -hmm. as well. My last question, I'm always a curious person. What did you learn at the ARA show? Anything surprised you? What, what's one of your new takeaways after being in New Orleans the last few days? Um, I, I will say that, you know, as I get older... I think less and less of of trade show activity and and the key is really the people right mm -hmm. so I'm I'm kind of like and and there's no question my number one takeaway for anybody and everybody is please 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 go visit any technology booths so mm -hmm. tech stack is not talked about a lot it is going to be a big part of your future the next 3 to 5 years I'm working in the insurance industry as well with peer groups and everything is tech stack, tech stack, tech stack. Um, it, it, you might not know what that means right now, but ultimately we need to start evaluating how you are plugging into your customers and your market, your prospects. And there's just so much to go on. So I was hitting all the digital marketing uh, operators. I'm hitting all the technology companies just to see what, what makes them unique. Hmm. And I like to focus on, on, on people too. It's all about our relationships. Everyone's got a cool booth, but at the end of the day, we're all people. And it's cool for me, even just in the third year, you start seeing the same people and it's a really big industry growing fast, but it's also a very small industry where you sort of get to know everyone, which, which I, I enjoy as well. Yes. Very good point. Very good point. It's been my life for 25 years at least. So mm -hmm. I, I can vouch for uh, how enriching it has been. Cool. Well, awesome episode, Dan. Thanks for, for, for coming on. Um, Definitely going to hopefully see you at the Meeting of the Minds uh, later this year. Maybe hopefully see you uh, before that as well. But I really appreciate you coming off and awesome talking to you. Excellent. Well, I appreciate your time too. I know you, uh, you've you got to be exhausted after your week. So congratulations on a great show. Yeah, I've been drinking a lot of coffee, as you saw. But uh, <laughs> good to see you, Dan. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, everyone. Take care. All right. See you guys. You've been listening to Peer Talk from Peer Executive Groups, produced and directed by Noah Crowley and hosted by Dan Crowley. Subscribe to this podcast for notifications of future episodes of Peer Talk.